Well, good morning, HGA, and congratulations on making it to the interview. We are certainly delighted to have you here and, and really looking forward to your presentation. Um, as a reminder, you have 20 minutes for your presentation, and we will be asking questions for another 20 minutes. Uh, and your time will start when I we turn it over to you after we do our introduction. With that, I will start the roll. Karen Fogarty Miller, board support. Present. Okay, Sue Anderson, representing Minnesota State Arts Board. Present. Okay, Bill Byer, representing AIA Minnesota. Present. Tom Murphy, representing the Associated General Contract. Present. Jan Chagalas, from the American Council of Engineering Companies. Present. Ted Tucker, public member of the board. Glenn, I'm gonna turn it over to you to do the introductions. Yes, I'm Glenn Hano. I'm with the Department of Administration, Real Estate and Construction Services. And with the agency, we have representatives, Joe Kelly, um, he's the director of uh, Department of Public Safety, Homeland Security, Energy Management. And I believe we also have Kevin Reed, the assistant director. And with that, I am Catherine Leonard, Chair and Public Member of the Board. And for your information, we have in our audience six members who are also attending at this time. With that, we will turn it over to you uh, for your presentation. Yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Bill Blansky. I'm an architect with deep experience in designing emergency operations centers. And it's my great hope to serve you as the design principal of this new state of Minnesota Emergency Operations Center. Everything has changed since that first pre-design was published, hasn't it? And it even continues to change. Even since the RFP came out, <laughs> uh, we're experiencing new ways to respond to emergencies and to lead our communities through them. Now, our principal, Wood um, Wiederholt, isn't here today due to an unexpected medical absence. Uh, but Deborah Young and I have Jay's duties uh, covered in the intervening weeks awaiting his return. And uh, we'll get this project started off on the right foot if we're selected. Now, the way this building looks matters. Um, I'll take care of that as design principle, but that isn't the only thing, right? There's a lot of parts that our team will bring together into a whole. And the people working in this facility are real people. There are neighbors, there are friends, and they spend sometimes 12 to 16 hour shifts in this place. It's more than just an office building. Sometimes they even spend their lives here. So this is our complete team. Um, we can cover all aspects of this complex project. It's what we do. Uh, this is a great team. Deborah Young and Sarah Verseth, by the way, um, led the complex uh, state of Minnesota Capitol building restoration. And so we're used to working with, with the whole state watching us. We're used to that and balancing the sensitivities of, of doing great design for buildings while also caring for their requirements. So Deborah. Morning, um, I'm Deborah Young, the project manager for the HGA design team. Um, your project has multiple stakeholders um, critical life and death functional needs and a budget and schedule that you've shared with us. And we need to track all of those items throughout. We'll need to deal with these issues head on and our whole team um, that you've just seen the slide of. Um, I've um, asked these six members to come specifically today to speak with you about the experience we bring in the approach we'll take to the project, specifically the design um, pre-design phase when the framework of your project is established. This is the team that will lead your stakeholders through that process. Sarah? I'm Sarah Berseth and I'll be the lead mechanical engineer. I bring to this project my experience on several similar facilities, but I really get a lot of energy and enjoy working with clients just like yourselves by assessing the needs and then designing the engineering systems and infrastructure to meet those demands of the program. At this point, I'll hand it off to Michael, who was another player on the Minnesota State Capital Project. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Rosen. 
I'm the president of Rosen Security. We are a security consulting and risk management firm headquartered right here in Minneapolis and are also a very close partner of HGA. We have also worked together with HGA on the Minnesota State Capital Project. Um, we will be responsible for the security planning and security design of the planned EOT building. Uh, we bring significant experience with assessing, designing, and implementing security operations for high risk state and federal facilities across the United States to include sites like the Pentagon, state capitals, and several other emergency operation centers. I am thrilled and honored to be part of this high quality team and contribute the security that's critical to our state facility. Next, I would like to introduce to you, Rich. Good morning, I'm Rich Bonin. I'll be the designer of the interior environments and I bring the knowledge and experience of similar projects to this as well as seven FBI secure regional headquarters buildings that Bill and I have done over the years. So we know what it takes to do this. During pre-design, I'll be very focused on the programming and Bill said, you know, the, the way this looks really matters, but it, the way it functions also really matters as well. So the design should focus on the people and support the work that they do. I'll work closely with my colleague, Steve Weir, from our Washington, D.C. office. Hi, my name is Steve Weir. I'll be working out of the D.C. office to support Rich in the design of this operations center. Uh, my expert expertise is very specific to operation centers. I led the design for the National Counterterrorism Center in 2002. It was a direct result of the 9-11 attacks. I've since led the design for 12 additional operation centers for the intelligence community and have a 20,000 square foot center starting construction next month. Now we want to take a moment to walk you through the process of how particularly the process will take during the pre-design phase. You've provided us with an overall schedule that's doable, but it will move very fast and does have a lot of responsibility by all parties to make the um, phase successful. Um, the approach we take during pre-design is critical because it focuses the whole project team on the big picture aspects of the project and it develops a common language and understanding that we'll all share. Bill and Michael. Now, evaluating the site is one of the key aspects of a good programming and pre-design phase. It really sets the table for the design process to, to be run properly. You saw these three diagrams in our RFP response. We know you're looking for something in the North Metro. Uh, we thought maybe Blaine. So this actual site on 109th is in Blaine and we analyzed it. We just did a conjectural analysis. Now I think it sets the table to show you how we'll do it with you when we actually know what the site might be. So issues of security, setback, uh, arrival, parking, uh, stormwater management, anything related to making this a B3 project as it relates to the site becomes really important and expansion. But it's a, it's a state operating facility for the, for the emergency center. And so making sure that that becomes a clear part of what the facility is, even from the point of view of designing the site. And the security issues will be critical as well. Yeah, and as Bill mentioned, um, uh, an effective security operation, in our opinion, for any facility starts with an optimal site for security. Uh, and as part of the site selection process, if we were to be involved, we will conduct an initial security risk assessment of the plant facility and provide a security site analysis of the location options. Specifically, we will pay uh, close attention to elements such as accessibility, recognizability, proximity to other high visibility and uh, high risk sites, uh, ability to create uh, what's known as a natural surveillance, natural access control, and territorial reinforcement. Furthermore, right, uh, when we think about security and echoing Bill's earlier comments, the United States government and its facilities have faced a dramatic shift in a threat landscape in 2020. The Department of Homeland Security has correctly identified that the United States critical infrastructure will continue to face significant threats of physical and cyber attacks in years to come. One important concept that I personally have learned in my years in the security field is if you fail to predict the threat, you will always fail to protect against it. And our team brings that specific experience in predicting the threat actors, modeling their modus operandi, and designing proactive security operations capable of deterring, detecting, and preventing potential threat actors from uh, carrying out their attacks. We believe in a risk-based approach to security. We will make sure the planned EOC has state-of-the-art layers of security, 
uh, a combination of proper balance of three main domains of security, which are physical measures, technology, and operations. Uh, these domains will meet United Unified Facilities Criteria standards set by Department of Defense, uh, as well as NIST 830 framework for managing cybersecurity risks and other proven practices for managing physical and cybersecurity risk. Uh, now, moving to Rich, who can talk a little bit about programming. Programming is going to be a really important part of our work with you. And to meet the schedule, we'll need to work together as a team to establish the program initially. We'll build on what's been learned since the pre-designed document was done, especially all that uh, 2020 gave us with uh, the pandemic, social unrest, and an economic crisis, all, all things that are dealt with in a facility like this. And our goal will be to understand the pieces and how they should be configured. We know that there are some basic elements for how these facilities work and how they are successful. There's the EOC kind of main room, there's the collaboration spaces and so on. We took a look at some of these key pieces and we know what we need to plan for. So we did some quick study options for how we might organize them here. These kind of four basic options uh, are all oriented around the big EOC main room. And since there are a lot of stakeholders, these are the types of studies that we'll want to do to elicit the best responses, make decisions, and move forward. Some of these diagrams work better than others, and some focus uh, on different aspects, but we kind of wanted to make sure we always focused on the people and uh, making a place for them to do their best work. The first one is kind of this wraparound scheme that uh, rings the main EOC room with all the components needed to support it. It uh, has spaces like the data, telecom, communication spaces, a little more back of house behind the big screen, but then keeping spaces for staff shown in the green there for places to rejuvenate and refresh and get away from the stress of, uh, of the, what's going on in the big room. We even wonder if there are things like nap rooms that should be included in, in that type of space. If we look at uh, the arrangement in uh, kind of three dimensions where we might start to think, is there a second level to this? Do some of those collaboration spaces benefit from having an overall view down to the main EOC room? Is this a space for a media uh, space that allows you to connect from this building to communicate out in a controlled way. And then we also looked at kind of more of a linear arrangement of spaces that puts things at the front and the back and allows the sides to kind of connect to other parts of the building. And maybe this is the space and the place to put those rejuvenation spaces on the second level. In the this flanking layout, we looked at uh, the collaboration spaces uh, and some of the uh, rejuvenation spaces on either end and, and then keeping the back open to connect to other parts of the building. Um, to make any of these layouts work, we'll incorporate the knowledge that we know and that we've learned during programming, but also from our experience. The key to these is the details, and that's what Steve is the expert at and really enjoys digging into the detail. There are several uh, basic planning considerations when uh, designing an operations uh, center. The ops floor seating uh, and arrangement align for clear circulation, allowing um, the operators to, you know, get to a conference room, huddle room, space, space uh, uh, breakout room quickly and easily without uh, interrupting another operator is important. Um, the server room space is always, uh, you just never want to undersize it because you're, you're feeding multiple systems to the desk. Um, we know that um, raised access flooring is the best way to get um, uh, power, comm, and data to each one of the desks. And, um, and we found that the acoustic environment is, is, is just critical to, to the operation of the spaces. The finishes we put on the floors, the walls, the ceilings help shape the space acoustically. And then the, the other main influencer is the lighting. 
you want to light the the, the op centers at a level that um, allows them to do their work. Um, next slide. Situational awareness has become the theme for all of these op centers, and it started with this NCTC uh, center here. Um, the idea of uh, clear sight lines from the desk um, to the display walls is is critical. Um, the content that's being thrown on the wall has to be at a resolution that is readable from all the from all the desks. And um, and we've also discovered that um, the technology is constantly evolving, and that clearly for this op center. We need to be designing for the technology that's going to be new in 2023. HVAC is another really important factor into that. I'm going to turn you over to Sarah. Thanks, Steve. The details of the HVAC layout will be critical to success. We'll design in a low velocity air distribution system, likely through an underfloor, enhanced acoustics, and higher percentages of outside air. But let's zoom out a little bit bigger picture for a moment. During the pre-design, HGA's engineers will be assessing the risks and variables that have to be factored into the design. From what we've heard from you, some things that come to mind right now are that the building schedule will change, the occupancy will be extremely variable, loads will differ as events occur, and of course the threats are ever changing, whether these be from the environment, people, and what we've seen in the last nine months, viruses. With the challenges, we'll layer in the goals. Redundancy, resiliency, and then of course thermal comfort as the occupants of the space can spend multiple hours and then even days there working. HGA's engineers are adept at leading clients like yourselves through this complicated decision making process. We layer the risks, the variables, and the goals of the project to develop options. We fold in energy modeling because we understand that this project has a goal to meet B3. And then first cost analysis and life cycle cost analysis, along with the pros and cons of systems to make good choices that have buy in from the entire team and keep the project on schedule. Over the last nine months, systems have been required to adapt and adjust to the changing science behind COVID-19. We've learned that we have to treat COVID-19 at the plume, the room and the system, and we're increasing outside air as much as possible. But the systems of this facility need to be designed not just for this pandemic, but the next. The next pandemic may require us to minimize outside air. Our team is adept at forecasting these future risks and designing systems to meet them. Ultimately, near, nearly all of this infrastructure is hidden behind the walls, and I'll hand it over to Bill and Rich to discuss some of their thoughts on the design. Bill, we're not able to hear you. We do listen to tapes, Joe. Sorry about that. I have to put a dollar in the jar. Joe and Glenn, we heard you. And we know that the 267 days spent in the facility really made a difference for you. So we know that making this place look good and work good is important. This collage kind of focuses on spaces for people, spaces to relax, rejuvenate, and refresh. This is going to be an important piece of the success of this building. And Bill and I have done many projects together over the past 20 years, and it is these types of complex facilities that are designed for real people working in them that really get us excited. Our focus so far in the presentation has been um, related to uh, primarily pre-design, but it is our responsibility to deliver great service throughout the entire project. Um, as the project manager, it'll be my responsibility to make sure that inter internal quality assurance reviews are occurring, as well as those page turn reviews and review periods established for your stakeholders to review the uh, documentation and design at each um, phase of the project and making sure we're on track with the ultimate project goals. Um, as the PM, I stay with the project from pre-design through construction and closeout, along with my key discipline leads. Um, we believe that this kind of continuity is really important to the quality of the project overall. Um, you've been very clear that cost is an important driver and our team is going to be providing parametric cost estimates 
until such time, <coughs> excuse me, as a, the construction manager would take over that responsibility. Um, bringing the CM on board will be a great um, asset to the team because they're going to bring um, some focus on um, construction schedule and constructability issues that will help the team overall. The schedule you've outlined, which is represented along the top um, line of this slide, um, is definitely doable, um, but it will move quickly. And we are aware, you know, based upon our experience on the capital and other projects, that sometimes change happens. Sometimes it's unforeseen, sometimes it occurs during design or construction. If needed, I did want to emphasize that the HTA team is flexible and has the bench strength in order to make adjustments to the schedule while delivering the project on time. Bill? We'd like, if we could, we'd like about 30 seconds at the end to close, but now we just want to really reemphasize that our team is driven to deliver. We want to lead this process for you to give you a functioning facility with operational excellence that works extraordinarily well and looks great and meets all the sustainability goals. So thanks for this opportunity to share our team with you and our, our ideas, and uh, we're ready for a Q&A discussion. Thank you. I had my mic on that time, so I didn't have to put it in the jar. Catherine, it looks like you're trying to talk and you're muted, Catherine. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, no problem. Um, appreciate that. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn for the first question. <clears throat> yes. Um, this question, I think I'll direct to Bill. Bill, could you let me know what you think is your closest example that would match the program of our state emergency operations center and what lessons you may have learned in designing that facility? That's a good question. I, I think I'd like to go to, I'm tempted to go to the ones we've been doing in, in DC in our nation's capital, but I think they're of a different scale. But the lessons there will be equally applicable. But I think the one that's closest would be the FBI facility in Brooklyn Center. Now, it's not as large, but as an overall facility and the emergency operations center that's in it, it has the key components. We have the raised floor. We have the, the main operating room where the uh, uh, sessions all come together with the media wall. It's surrounded by breakout spaces, uh, annexed conference rooms, a kitchenette. Uh, certain offices are brought to that uh, part of the building and where it's placed within the overall structure was really critical. It had to deal with arrival of guests. It had to deal with staff that might be there for long periods of time. And if you're not familiar with that facility, we would love to uh, find an opportunity to get clearance and give you a tour if you haven't been there. I imagine you may have. Um, we actually saw it on the news a couple of times during the events that occurred uh, last spring. Okay, uh, turn to the board for a question. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Ted Tucker, public member. Uh, in one of your quotes, I think it was from Stephen Weird, you talk about blending the technical requirements with the architectural environment uh, that stimulate the uh, so the working at their high, uh, uh, users at working at the highest level. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit and some examples that will help me understand this blend. Um, Sarah, could you uh, click back to the, I think it's my second slide. The NCTC space was, uh, is, Kind of that example, uh, the analysts that work in there. Uh, so that's been up since um, 2002. The, we've actually um, reconfigured the desks since then. But the lighting uh, scene around there, we're not emphasizing the finish on the ceiling, but that ceiling has a, a acoustic uh, sound deadening in it. And the, the floor is soft. And the combination of, of 
those finishes and uh, without being an overt finish, they become a non-finish in this particular case. Um, just uh, make the space feel like uh, you're in a room that's important. Um, there was a, a lighting designer uh, consultant we used on that. It worked for uh, Disney Studios and their Imagineering uh, studio. And um, his whole take on uh, lighting design on this is um, make the people feel like they're in a special space. Uh, the blue light that they used as a, as a background in this room is actually a stimulant. And I think every time you watch TV and you look at a news anchor's desk um, across the board, you're going to see blue light in there. And it is, uh, uh, there's, it's, it's science behind it, blue light. It's really hard to go to sleep in blue light. Um, and, um, and it's there, I, so they use it for that reason. And I'll just add, a, this is Rich, I'll just add a little onto that, uh, Ted. You know, the, the things that we do know about how these spaces work is the, the need for kind of the time together in the big room balanced with the time that is spent in small groups, in, uh, in focused rooms where uh, individual pieces of the bigger problem are being talked about and then come back to working in the big room. And, uh, you know, having those other spaces around helps people do their best work, stay focused. And then, uh, as we mentioned, too, the, the other really important piece of that is the time away from both of those activities, from the, the group activities and the focused activities. And that's time to, you know, grab something to eat, a cup of coffee, or uh, even in, in periods where people are here for a long, long time, you know, take a shower, lay down for just a moment, and, and being able to do all of those things in a place that, you know, steps you away from the stress of what's going on in the moment and, and take just a moment to, to clear your mind and then come back. And we find, you know, that's how people do their best work. It's how people really uh, stay focused and uh, stay on top of their game for long, long periods of time. So it's spaces like this that all support that, you know, creating, you know, a lounge coffee shop almost kind of environment that just feels really different than the main space and locker rooms. And uh, although, Steve, I don't think we've ever done a game room in uh, any of these facilities, but, uh, you know, again, we can. No, we have not. What, what, type of, <laughs> what types of things really work for that? But uh, hopefully that answers your question, Ted. Well, I like the nap room, but that's just me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, we've done those in a number of corporate facilities, and uh, there's actually nap pods, and there's a whole kind of uh, industry that's built around around the nap in the, the office environment. <laughs> So, question from uh, Homeland Security or Glenn. Hey, hey, Glenn. This is this is Joe. I'd like to I'd like to ask a question and, and uh, for the ECA team. I'm Joe Kelly. I'm the state's emergency management uh, director. Uh, a lot of things changed in 2020, and we'll continue to learn in 2021. Setting the pandemic and all that aside, I think. Some things that we've really gotten focused on during this activation is the thirst for information and the need to have a, a high functioning media center uh, for us as well as for the governor and other and other senior officials. And then also related to that is the need to have the ability to distribute our training and education programs, record products. Uh, have more virtual meetings. I mean, the, the, the thing that we're doing here today is an example. Able to do that in a high quality uh, manner is really important. So can you talk a little bit about how you see kind of media and distributed education, uh, remote meetings and so forth in a facility like this, please? This is Rich. I can start with that, and uh, I imagine a few other of my colleagues might have some things to say as well. But uh, 
Joe, you're right. The, you know, the pandemic has really uh, shown everybody that there are lots of different ways to work, and even in a in a crisis like this, so the expansion of uh, video and connection connections virtually is is a really important piece of that. But also the the idea, like you mentioned, the you know, I think everybody realizes it and expects it from the immediacy of our media these days, our, the social media, the access to so many different news channels that people, there's a huge thirst in a, in a crisis for people to know what's going on and know immediately. So this will be a really important part of uh, the facility here is, you know, whether it's broadcast quality spaces, Years ago, uh, Bill and I did Minnesota Public Radio's uh, headquarters in downtown St. Paul and really got to have uh, a good understanding of what it takes to do broadcast quality uh, spaces. Um, but I, you know, I think that'll probably happen in a variety of different ways. You know, a number of years ago, I did the Star Tribune headquarters as well. And, you know, everybody thinks of them as the newspaper but a huge part of the design of that was webcasts that could happen immediately right from the news floor and uh, you know, setting it up, designing the space to be able to accommodate that was a really important part of that project as well. One other thing I think it would help to think about relative to this question, Joe, is it's our understanding that this facility will become quite active when you're in your high performing mode. A lot of people coming, a lot of people going, and so the relationship of access, how the perimeter is uh, defined, the degree of security you'll be looking for, um, and how parking relates to the entry points. So you mentioned that it's possible that the governor, for example, and or other people that are in the um, emergency management um, arena will be coming and going from the facility during these events. And that's part of getting the information where it needs to be. So addressing those issues actually starts even at the site design conversation for in and out and parking and adjacency, proximity. And at the same time, you'll have probably have the press potentially and, and other visitors. So that's all gonna need to be managed and cared for in a, in a very choreographed way. Question from the board. I have a question for Sarah. Um, and it has to do with, with, as Bill alluded to, the sort of wildly fluctuating occupant loads of the building. Um, how does that affect compliance with B3 or do you see any particular issues involved with that? It's a great question and something we'll, we will definitely fold into the energy analysis. We have a lot of clients that have variable loads, whether it be with um, similar to this, where you have to ramp up quickly with your occupants, with the technology, um, or just facilities that have a variety of different occupants and the variable loads. We've had a lot of success with air handling units, um, a newer technology called fan wall technology that allows those units to respond to the load in the building. And those uh, fans are smaller and also contribute to the reduced energy usage. Ultimately, we, as part of the pre-design process, will hear from all of the stakeholders, what is the maximum occupancy of the building? And then what are those rare moments where we're at really minimum occupancy? And we'll factor that into the redundancy questions, what equipment needs to be designed for N plus one. And we are uh, extremely adept at an iterative energy modeling process and then folding in that life cycle cost analysis so that we design the correct equipment to be N plus one redundancy while also meeting the energy goals. Thanks. So back to Joe, Glenn, Kevin. Oh, do you have one? Yeah, yeah, I do. I'd like to follow up a little bit uh, on what Bill was was talking about. Uh, and this question probably is directed at, uh, at at Michael, and that is, you know, how do you how do you take uh, what are your thoughts, ideas, concepts for taking a, a building that should be open and welcoming in a public building? We're doing you know trainings and conferences and and routine meetings. 
to making sure that facility is absolutely secure uh, when we go to that uh, one of those I think, uh, Bill referred to high performing period. So just kind of how do you how do you do that without building a without building a bomb shelter? Because one we don't want that. Two we can't. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Good question, Joe. And, you know, we, I have a lot of experience in doing just that in balancing the need for, uh, you know, access and making the facilities look open and welcoming, yet being secure. You know, a couple of examples come to mind. You know, the, the, the philosophical approach to this concept is asset based, right? So, you know, within the facility, right, you, you, you divide, you design, identify what are the most critical assets, right? And those critical assets deserve additional layers of security. For example, the floor that you're going to have there, right? The data uh, and other areas are going to be controlled. <laughs> there, you, you design it from the beginning to have additional layers of security that will prevent easy access, will prevent uh, easy damage to those assets, right? The areas where uh, you expect public to be uh, welcome, you design it up front in such a way that you know, public could be uh, properly screened, and you know, you know, another part of this of this uh, opportunity here is to design the operations, the security operations around it, around the facility, rather to try to retrofit them after the fact, which commonly happens. By thinking ahead of that, you know, we will think through the operational aspects: how do you do visitor management? How do you pre-screen visitors before they before they come in? And then, you know, the again by by dividing the critical assets. From the areas where public can access, you are ensuring that the critical site is protected. Where where those where, where the areas it's not it's not as uh, uh, as protected. We have the same experience. I remember the same challenge. We did work in uh, city of Chicago, uh, the Office of Emergency Management and Communication, and we had to strike that balance uh, where you know the critical assets were identified to be very vulnerable at the time when we got involved. The facility was already built, and we had to kind of retro retrofit. You know measures and practices to protect the critical assets yet allow uh, a facility to be appear to be open and and welcoming for those that have a reason to be there. So I hope that answers your questions. I have multiple other examples that I can run this through. Thank you. So question, <clears throat> excuse me, question from the board. Yeah, I have one. Uh, it's probably a question to Sarah. Uh, in your proposal, you're talking about to prepare building to be a net zero ready. Would you elaborate a little bit? What does it mean? Net zero ready buildings are, um, well, HTA takes a really holistic approach to sustainability. And so I want you all to know that we will not be taking our sustainability dust and sprinkling it over the project. Bill <laughs> and Rich and I work together on high performance buildings and we all understand that it is a very collaborative team effort. Um, we have to look at the envelope. What percentage of glazing will be included in the building? What will be the R value of the walls and the roof? Which direction will the building's facade face that has the most glazing and how will that affect energy use? And so I really challenge Bill and Rich in the beginning of programming and site selection and placing the building on the sites to think um, not just immediately, but uh, long term, how will that building site and how will the location of the building on the site affect the energy usage? So already before I've started looking at the mechanical systems, we've made decisions that are um, setting the project on the right trajectory to be net zero ready. We layer in mechanical, electrical, lighting, and infrastructure solutions that each of those decisions reduce the building's energy as much as possible to a low EUI target and then supplement with on-site renewables. So a net zero energy building is not net zero through the system choices, but we all of those system choices are getting the building ready to be really low energy use. And then we use on-site renewables to meet that net zero goal. Thank you. Question from Joe Kevin Blam. Go ahead, Glenn, if you have one. Well, um, in the pre-proposal meeting, um, Homeland Security also mentioned the need for flexibility. I, I realize there's a, the big room, which is pretty flexible, but how, how, would, how do you see all the ancillary rooms and the need for, I don't know, redefining the needs for each situation? This is Rich. I can start with that. 
Rich, go for it. They're probably going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, at this point, we've worked together so long that we can pretty much complete each other's sentences. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that that could be done. Um, you know, some of uh, our clients that are really looking for maximum flexibility do things like a raised access floor with demountable walls on top of it and that with a, you know, a ceiling system that allows for movement of mechanical and HVAC systems above it so that you can take down and reconfigure rooms uh, even over a weekend if you need to. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, kind of room dividing uh, materials and products that we've looked at and used on many projects as well. So some of the images we showed earlier were rooms that could be divided from one room into three smaller rooms. So those types of things build in flexibility as well. Uh, Sarah mentioned some of the flexibility that we can build into the mechanical and electrical systems. and. Again, it's also a matter of kind of figuring out uh, where you need the flexibility because it, it has a cost and uh, we want to spend the dollars on the things that and the places that really matters where you do need the flexibility. Thank you. Question from the board. I have a question. Um, I have a couple of questions and uh, trying to figure out which is the most important one. <laughs> well, you, so you can ask them both. All right, all right. My first one was uh, regarding security um, at a time uh, when there's constantly changing technology and uh, with the need to design this building for the future, I'm wondering how that's approached by the client. So that's my first one in terms of budget and designing for the future when it comes to security systems. Maybe more about data intrusion, uh, cyber. Well, and and I sadly I'm going to interrupt you because I forgot to look at my timer when I said you got time for a question, and I'm sorry you don't. Okay, I, I apologize to all of you. Um, and, and with that, I want to. Uh, offer Bill his 30 seconds of time to um, wrap up. Uh, the answer to the question, Susan, would be robustly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for this opportunity to visit you this morning. You know, the state of Minnesota desperately needs this state of the art emergency operations center. And it needs, we need it because our, our communities need that service. So this project is right in our swim lane. It's right in our wheelhouse. And we would be very, very honored to be selected to serve the state and to serve you as your design team for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And with that, um, you could expect to hear from the executive secretary either later this afternoon or tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you.